Hello everyone and welcome to the Marketplace Conference. My name is Jeroen Arts, I'm Associate Partner at Speed Invest. And on behalf of our co-organizers, Autotech Ventures and Battery Ventures, it is my pleasure to welcome you to what is hopefully going to be two exciting days of Marketplace Conference. Now before we get things going, I want to say a quick thank you to our sponsors. So first of all, JP Morgan, Silicon Valley Bank, Sandbird, but also the other sponsors that have contributed to this event, Thank you. If it wasn't for you, we would not be able to pull this off. Now we thought a little bit about how do we start a conference like this in a year that has been as crazy as this one. And we came to the conclusion that it would be interesting to share some strategies of how marketplaces improvised, adapted, and ultimately tried to overcome the COVID pandemic. Because we all know, I mean, 2020 has been a crazy year and we saw marketplace being affected both on a very positive way as also a very negative way. I think on the more positive side, we had examples like Zoom. At one point they were growing more than 4,000% year over year, but also a company like Robinhood found themselves in a perfect storm as a lot of people were forced to stay at home. Stock markets were very volatile with prices of shares actually dipping and people thought, oh, why don't I become a trader? On the other side of the spectrum, we saw companies like Airbnb and GlassPass really suffering from the COVID pandemic. If you have read the, the IPO filing for Airbnb, you could read that at one point in the crisis, revenues declined with more than 70%. For GlassPass, the number was even bigger, 95%. So it's fair to say that marketplaces have been affected all across the board. Now, I think what's very important is that we realize that we're only at half, half time. We're now roughly 10 months into this pandemic, but we might still have another six, nine, if not 12 months before we get back to some form of normality. And with that in mind, we thought it would be helpful to share some of the inspirational um, strategies that we have seen from marketplace businesses that really try to make the best out of this crisis. Because you know what they say, never waste a good crisis. So we put this down into like four different strategies. And the first one is an obvious one, support your base. I think a great example here is actually a platform like Get Your Guide. I think most of you know it. It's a platform where you can book your local tour guide to go for a trip in a new, a new country or city. And what they did is in my view quite phenomenal. Not only did they make it much more flexible for customers to cancel their booking to ultimately hours before the booking would actually take place, at the same time, they also decided to not do that at the expense of their supplier base, their guides. So if someone would cancel very much last minute, they still decided to pay out the suppliers. And I think this sends a great message for you as a marketplace platform to all your customers. We are there for you. We will help you get to this crisis. We've seen a similar example quite recently also with Apple when they decided to cut the commission fees for small businesses from 30 to 15%. You could argue Apple was a little bit late to the table as they just started to roll this out. But again, it shows that marketplaces and platforms, I think really have an opportunity to show them from the, your best side during a time of crisis. Now, the second type of strategy is much more about getting the most out of the crisis. And we saw a lot of examples where marketplace businesses tried to use the crisis as an opportunity to increase their market share. And when we look into the demand side of the marketplace, we saw, for instance, a company like Mindful Chef, which is effectively a healthy food delivery services. It was a business that basically sent you a nice meal to feed your family. What they smartly recognized in the midst of the crisis was that a lot of people actually flocked to buying frozen foods and other long-term foods for their pantries in order to stock up for the crisis. What they did was pretty clever. They added a lot of frozen meals to their lineup and used it as an opportunity to really increase their market share. Another example on this side of the market was 
actually in our portfolio with a company called T-Mobility, one of the leading micro-mobility providers. And in the midst of the crisis, when most of their competitors were actually pulling the scooters from the street, Tier consciously decided to actually stay on the street and try to serve their customer base as good as possible. As a result of, not, of just being able to operate in all of these cities, Tier has also been leading the download charts um, for a very long time during this crisis. Also on the demand side, we have seen a few examples where businesses actually try to capture this window of opportunity to really build and increase the size of, our, of their uh, supply side. I think the most important or the most well-known example uh, probably comes from businesses like Delivery Hero, Just Eat Takeaway, because they've been working with a lot of different restaurants, but there was always a subset of restaurants who were unwilling to join the platform. Now, because this crisis was ultimately uh, forcing restaurants to close down for dine-ins, it meant that the only way for these restaurants to actually still make business was to start for takeaway, take out and delivery. And Delivery Hero, as an example, managed to add more than 130,000 restaurants in just the second quarter of this year, which I think is a phenomenal result. Now the takeaway from these examples is that you can also use the crisis as an opportunity to really expand um, your market share. The challenge is that it often gives you only a very limited window of opportunity where you can deploy such strategies. Such strategies. So with that in mind, think for yourself, what can I actually do to really capture this moment to the best of my abilities and build the market share of my business? The third strategy that we have seen, I mean, you could argue whether it has been a strategy, is effectively a situation where businesses decide to turn emergency pivots into long-term business model extensions. I think a very obvious example is a company called Shoko. I mean, for those who are not familiar with Shoko, it's actually an app that restaurants use to order and procure directly from their supplier base. And in the middle of the pandemic, where a lot of restaurants closed down, Shoko was facing a situation where their demand side, their restaurant base, was fully out of business, but their supply base was very much intact. Shoko recognized that and decided to build a B2C channel, allowing these suppliers to sell directly to consumers. Another great example from really pivoting from a um, making an emergency pivot and then turning this into a long-term opportunity is a company called Reef Technologies. I mean, it's a bit more of a dramatic change, but still a super interesting one. I mean, Reef Technologies is ultimately known as a, a parking lot management app that operates more than 4,500 parking lots um, worldwide. What they recognized in the middle of the pandemic was that a lot of these parking lots were underutilized and it was actually an opportunity for them to start offering additional services. So instead of opening the parking lots for cars, they decided to host um, cloud kitchens, health clinics, solutions for logistics and last mile delivery. And with that, they effectively pivoted away from their initial business model and really incorporated new trends based on uh, recent customer behavior to still uh, operate their business. Now, the last set of examples is much more from leveraging the crisis as an opportunity to increase digital adoption. Because ultimately, as a startup, you're obviously playing in a game where you try to leverage tech to, you know, to, to, to give great value for all people on the marketplace. And I think one great example to take out here is actually also in our Speedinvest portfolio, a company called GoStudent. What GoStudent actually did from the get-go was that they helped students find a great tutor um, to help them with classes, to help them with exercises. But what they recognized was that in the middle of this crisis, there was actually an opportunity to onboard a whole new customer set to their platform. So what Goch student did was they enabled the platform, um, they opened up the platform for teachers 
to enable online classes. And with that, they really um, allowed a whole new customer segment to get on board to the platform and create much more touch points with the product than they were used to before. As a result, Go Student actually managed to grow quite significantly. Only in their first week, they had like 60 new teachers on the platform bringing their classes online. But actually in the months following that one, the company has been growing 50% month over month in terms of monthly active users. So these kind of strategies, I think are great examples that we have seen how um, marketplace businesses have tried to leverage the crisis to the best of their advantage. Um, so just to recap, you know, in a crisis, you want to make sure that you support your customer base. You are the friend. You, know, you want to be there for them in difficult times. The second one is you want to leverage your crisis in a way to increase your market share, both on the demand side and the supply side. There might be opportunities for you to build out your marketplace. You can, you can test out different emergency pivots and see how they fit into a long-term strategy. And ultimately, you can kind of like drive digital adoption and create more touch points from your customer base with your product to simply lock them in for uh, longer use. So with those like very practical examples, I would actually like to hand it over to my colleague, Matthias Ockenfels, who is going to interview Jörg Gerbich the COO of Just Eat Takeaway, to talk a little bit about their experiences going and running through this pandemic. Hello everyone, my name is Matthias. I'm a partner at Speed Invest managing our focus fund Speedinvest X, and I'm very happy to welcome Jörg Gerbig, COO and co-founder of Just Eat Takeaway today. Thanks for joining us, Jörg, and uh, great, great to have you. Thank you, Matthias. Hello, everybody. About a year ago, we actually sat together uh, at the last physical uh, marketplace conference face-to-face -face here in Berlin, and uh, obviously a lot has changed since then. So now we have to meet virtually uh, uh, over Zoom, although we are in the same city. Um, and a lot also has happened on your side and on the side of, uh, of Just Eat Takeaway. Uh, basically, uh, when we sat together about a year ago, you were talking about the uh, merger with uh, British Just Eat and uh, now, fast forward one year, uh, you had to adjust to a totally changing market. And uh, it would be great to dive into that a little bit deeper and have a closer look at how you and, and uh, Just Eat Takeaway weathered the storm. Yeah, it was indeed a very interesting uh, last year. I mean, when we sat together, we didn't even yet complete the merger. and. Um, Basically, then we got an interlooper coming into play, your former yep. uh, employer, uh, Naspers, and it became a, a bidding war for, for the asset, which was very, very interesting. And I think we could talk about uh, the whole story, how in the end we were successful in um, yeah, basically getting the merger done. Um, that, but that would take a full hour probably by itself. And then uh, shortly after, like you said, I mean, we... We didn't even fully complete the transaction yet because we still had the, the regulatory uh, officials uh, looking into that transaction, um, the opportunity of acquiring Uber, uh, uh, Grubhub Seamless in the US came, yeah. came across. And that was also very interesting because uh, COVID was just about to, to uh, unfold its whole force. And then, so we couldn't really travel anymore. So only one time I was flying over to to Chicago to visit the guys. Obviously, we knew from each other before and we, we met before, but doing a transaction of that size fully virtually yeah, is, that's pretty is impressive. something very interesting and unusual. Yeah, absolutely. No, the, I, I can imagine that. And uh, I think it was worth around about 6 billion euros, even more uh, uh, in an all stock, dollars. $7 million in an all stock deal. So uh, that's, that's quite a sizable number. And then in, in such circumstances, so uh, quite, quite the achievement. 
And yeah, we we'll, would love to also deep dive on that a little bit more uh, later in our conversation. But maybe to begin, uh, one question. Um, how, maybe you can talk a little bit about how COVID has impacted the food delivery industry and especially from your perspective as a leader in the industry. Sure. I mean, COVID obviously has hit a lot of us uh, uh, personally very hard, but also a lot of industries have been hit uh, very hard. And uh, you basically have accelerated um, the, the change uh, from offline to online. Um, but I think in the industry of the restaurants, you have to look at it a bit in a differentiated way. There's some restaurants, quite some restaurants, who are massively actually benefiting from the COVID situation. So the restaurants who were mainly restaurants delivering themselves and mainly having pickup and delivery as a focus of their core business, they actually benefited massively, you know, because they even uh, had higher uh, revenues during the lockdown areas uh, or, or, or times. And, and the restaurants who are mainly focused on the in-restaurant business, they were actually suffering because they weren't allowed to open. Yeah. So they had to look out for new opportunities and delivery was definitely one. So I think the whole industry massively is changing uh, yeah. because uh, we, we got a lot of influx from restaurants who are mainly focused around in-restaurant business who, who now said like, I have to diversify. I'm not sure whether there's a new lockdown or not. And so I need to be also delivering myself. I mean, they had capacity actually because uh, their, their, their kitchen was not at full capacity. So they had the capacity to also deliver themselves. Okay. Um, and they were actually uh, diversifying their risk. Um, so I think going forward, restaurants will consider uh, delivery pickup way more than they used to in the past. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we have to see how it develops. Uh, I think the very high end restaurants are probably suffering the most yeah. because for them, delivery is not easy to do. I mean, if you have Michelin star restaurants, uh, it's not really worth it delivering. It's also not the same experience. The experience yeah. at home, yeah? So we really need to make sure that uh, also these uh, segments of the, the restaurant business will survive. Yeah, absolutely. No, interesting. And maybe one follow on question to that. Did you support these restaurants that weren't able to deliver themselves uh, with delivery options or basically enabling them to, uh, to deliver? So basically also expanding the market uh, by, by supporting them? Yeah, so already in the first wave, we uh, allowed uh, that they can join us and, and offer free pickup at least. And now in the second wave, we actually reduced the commission rate for the existing restaurants who are taking our own delivery fleet by 25% uh, during the, the lockdown. And uh, also for new restaurants joining, uh, the first month was uh, free fully, uh, even if they take our own logistics. Okay. Um, so we, we try to support the, the restaurants here uh, quite a bit. Great. And, and we could see actually that, uh, for example, Pickup is a good example where mm -hmm. And basically, they can promote it to their customers. They don't need a website. They just use our website and functionality. And they can promote pickup where they don't have to pay any commission at all. Yeah, yeah. If you think about the kind of most material change for Just Eat Takeaway in the last 12 months, what, what was it, in a, both in a negative as well as in a, in a positive way? Yeah. I mean, obviously, transformational was the, the whole merger process and the integration mm -hmm. process, which is now going on. But um, that, that, that is really kind of reshaping the organization from scratch. No, you really, I, th I think it's important even for all founders to basically all the time rethink if you would set up the company new from scratch, yeah. how would you do it? And we're doing that right now no? because yeah. you're putting two companies together. And you have to rethink about your whole structure. Is that still? And the you actually already put works? two companies together before that, right? So effectively, exactly. it's three companies yeah. right now. Yeah, yeah. So like, actually, it was a pretty good practice before. Yeah. But before, when we took over the delivery here at Germany business, uh, they were just active in one uh, country, mm -hmm. you know, with uh, with Germany. But now, actually, that's an integration process in uh, 24 countries. So it's much yeah. more uh, complex. Um, but that's that's a huge step for us as a company. Um, but then also, like, uh, we realized during COVID times, I mean, it came so quick, but probably for all of the businesses, it came so quick in the end. And um, so we, we were really proud of the stuff, how fast they adapted to that new environment. And we were sending everyone to home office. Um, and at the beginning, people were saying, yeah, if we go to home office, we can't uh, hold up with uh, customer service, for example, yeah. um, because 
certain quality standards will not be there. And then if you have to do it, you just it do just it and works. it works. No? Yeah, yeah. It's like in the early days, it felt a bit like being a startup again, where yeah, yeah some people say that never works and then you just do it and it works. No, yeah. I mean, uh, usually you're not used to do that for a corporate, uh, which is a bit bigger yeah. um, because by now, I mean, uh, including just eat and excluding the US transaction, we have, uh, we have almost 10,000 uh, people. So you think like, yeah, it's not possible from yeah. one to the other day, but if it has to, it, it can be possible. Any examples of kind of strategic efforts that you maybe had also envisaged before the crisis that you discontinued or uh, maybe some that accelerated because of the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, the B2B business is definitely on our plate. I yeah. mean, uh, uh, you you might remember at the very beginning of our company in Germany, that was actually the model that we That's were That's how you started uh, out, yes. Exactly. We, yeah. we were going to corporates and said, like, don't you want to provide a budget to your employee, yeah. which they can use as an incentive. Yeah. And um, that's a business model which we also acquired, for example, in Israel, and it's mm -hmm. huge there. And um, I mean, actually, the pandemic hit that business model pretty severely because yeah, um, yeah people are not in the office, so of course that no, that, no that point in delivery. <laughs> However, I mean, like uh, people try to to make something uh, good during the pandemic for their employees who have to work at home. So we yeah. also see like a lot of influx of of people reconsidering and providing that budget actually also at home. So like yeah. this is something which uh, which we, we are focusing a lot because in the end, if you think about where we want to go as a company, I mean, some people want to become a, a logistics company. Mm -hmm. Like uh, Uber, Uber is kind of a logistics company. Some yeah. other competitors are saying uh, we want to be a logistics company. But if we think about it, I think it's not necessarily the, the, the best uh, strategic choice to, mm -hmm. to go. Like uh, it's it's a tough market, uh, thin margins, or mm -hmm. actually in most of the time we believe uh, you can't or can hardly get it profitable. Not, not sustainable. Yeah. Europe, mm -hmm. not so sustainable. So like for us, it's more like we right now with a with a with our customers, they they are ordering 13 times a year, mm -hmm. but you have contact with food more than 500 times. So for us, it's more about like how can we get from the 13 times to something like 100 times, 100 times a year, yeah. Yeah. and uh, there. Um, for example, B2B is one of the big factors where we actually can have more food contact, so to say. Yeah. And that's what we are we're driving a lot going forward as well. Okay, interesting. So uh, has changed the picture, but hasn't changed your view on the market, on, on how it will develop. Because at the end of the day, people need to eat. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, we sometimes say actually COVID for us was accelerating the channel shift by mm -hmm. a year or two. Okay. Now, usually we get, I mean, how the business model works is your marketplace, uh, your, your marketplace with network effects. Sure. And so every every year you have a certain amount of customers, which is coming to your existing customer base. And since we have such a high reorder rate, mm -hmm. those customers stick around until infinity almost. Yeah. And so uh, this year we got an influx of new customers, maybe for two years rather mm -hmm. than one. And they stick around as well. So like we just accelerated that channel shift mm. and you can see that across all the industries. Maybe zooming out a little bit on marketplaces, what, what makes them more resilient in such an environment? Yeah, I think in our case, there was also like the fact that it's food related and people always need to eat. Even mm. in a crisis, people need to eat. So that actually uh, contributed a lot to it. Of But course. generally, marketplace business obviously is, uh, has, has huge uh, advantages. You're building up a customer base, especially in a high frequency order business like ours, you're building up a customer base, um, which is then continuing to order forever with you and is usually not flipping to one of your competitors. Mm -hmm. The way how usually market shares are being shifted in our model is more like that others are getting new customers in faster than us and then they shift market share. But it's hardly that any customers or existing customer base are really shifting to, to competitor. Mm -hmm. So therefore, actually, it's very resistant. And also on the restaurant base side, so on the supply side, we also have a very, um, very stable supply side because the restaurants, there's no need for them to shift to someone else mm -hmm. um, because they're getting a lot of uh, revenues from us. I mean, an average restaurant in Germany gets and around probably even 000. more in, in this time, right? Uh, I mean, they're just yeah, I mean, like uh, yeah, 100,000 euros a year. And in, in, in some restaurant cases, it's even like seven digit uh, sum per year. So like okay. it's huge sums per restaurant. And so there's no need really to go to somewhere else. 
So that makes it a very stable business model and very hard to actually uh, disrupt uh, that business. And on top of it, in a in an area of food, which is uh, very stable as well. So maybe looking past COVID uh, a little bit, which trends and which changes in consumer behavior do you think will also outlast uh, the, the current environment, will outlast the pandemic? So, so what is here to stay? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think in the inner cities, uh, you might see uh, quite some more of the, of the Q-commerce, but it's quite niche, I think. So quick commerce, um, what you mean in terms uh, of quick, yeah. Uh, yeah, quick commerce. Um, yeah. But uh, grocery, uh, food grocery, uh, grocery delivery will become stronger. I mean, it took quite a while until this one picked up. I think mm -hmm. now, I think it's getting some traction. That that for sure. Mm -hmm. But also our business, as I said, I mean, we're only at fifteen percent of the population who ordered with us in Germany over mm -hmm. the last twelve months. In in the Netherlands, we're way over 30%. Interesting. So uh, that channel trip has just started. I mean, there's still a lot of the old population who's uh, probably not going to shift anymore towards online. But every year, there's a new generation coming out and they, they start using us. I mean, from a restaurant perspective, um, we now have uh, way more than 20,000 restaurants in Germany, for example, if you take that country. Uh, there is between 80 and 100,000 restaurants. And I think there will be quite a lot of these restaurants who are currently not having any delivery service. Think about delivery services because they are diversifying their business through it. They're diversifying the risk and they also uh, uh, will realize it's not really cannibalizing their main business, but it's really additive to their existing in restaurant business. Okay. So I think restaurants will become way more flexible thinking about um, online food ordering. Great. So uh, I think we are coming to the end um, of our fireside chat with Jörg. Uh, I'm very happy that he found the time to, to join us and tell us a little bit more about uh, how he experienced the last 12 months since we last spoke uh, at the Marketplace conference. So uh, thanks a lot to everyone for joining us and many thanks to Jörg for being with us today. And yeah, looking forward uh, how things will develop on your end and also now in the US. Thanks, Jörg. Yeah, thanks a lot, Matthias. Uh, always great to be with you. I mean, uh, I'm not sure for, for the benefit of the audience uh, the, if everyone knows, but Matthias was actually first round investor with his uh, <laughs> fund those days uh, more than 10 years ago, 11, 12 years ago. Um, so uh, great to see uh, we're still connected. And, yeah. Uh, Very happy to be here and thanks a lot for everyone. Absolutely. Watching. Thank you, Jörg. Thanks for the shout out.